Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Jonathan Marrera, and uh, welcome to Grand Rounds. Today, we're very pleased to have uh, as our speaker, Dr. Nicholas Volpe. Uh, he is the Tari Professor and Chairman of the Department of Ophthalmology and Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine. He completed residency, fellowship, and chief residency at the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary. His research interests include uh, pardon me, new diagnostic technologies, including uh, pupillometry, invisible light optical coherence tomography, imaging abnormalities in neurodegenerative diseases, surgical education of ophthalmology residents, adult strabismus surgery, and clinical trials for optic nerve disease. He's a member of the AOS, a director of the HEED Foundation, and a member of the board of the AUPO. Um, so thank you. Please extend a warm welcome to Dr. Volpe. Thank you, Dr. Volpe. We look forward to your talk. Uh, well, welcome, and, and thanks for the introduction. Thanks for having me. It's uh, an, an interesting moment for me because I reflect on when I agreed to do this talk, and suddenly a year later it's here, and I'm sitting at my computer in a way that I would have never envisioned doing it. But um, I'm bl glad to be here and glad to share some perspectives as an ophthalmologist, uh, and my relationship with many of you as oncologists is critically uh, important because of the overlap between what we do. And it might seem like a stretch, but hopefully after the next 50 minutes or so, I will convince you uh, that we do indeed have significant overlap. Uh, I have nothing that's relevant to disclose here. Jonathan mentioned that I have a research interest in a Northwestern company that's exploring visible light OCT. I'm not going to show any pictures. And in a moment of self selfless, self shameless self-promotion, uh, I do receive royalties from my textbook. Okay, so here we're going to uh, tell a story about cancer patients and what can happen to their eyes, uh, not so much their eyeballs themselves. Uh, I'll mostly focus on the retina and beyond, if you will, as a neuro-ophthalmologist, local and direct metastatic uh, local effects that are either the result of the cancer itself or metastatic disease, carneoplastic issues, uh, complications from radiation treatment, and uh, some of the other things that are really ubiquitous for the cancer patients as it relates to uh, specifically neuroophthalmology are going to be asthenia, hypercoagulability, lots of stuff that involves the surface of the eye that I'm not going to spend a lot of time on. I'll introduce some cases throughout to make it interesting. Uh, I am uh, going to take a leap of faith here and assume that a lot of you are still relatively uncomfortable with an eye exam and what are the salient aspects of the history and exam that you should be able to get as an oncologist seeing a patient with symptoms. We'll talk about, about papilledema, some various manifestations of metastatic disease as it relates to the eye, uh, a special section on uh, my favorite of all disorders, lymphoma uh, and leukemia and how they affect the eye and some uh, time on side effects of treatment. Uh, <clears throat> if any of this makes you nervous, fear not. Uh, we have a great collection of neuroophthalmologists here at Northwestern. Uh, myself, uh, Shira Simon, Nina Shirayel, uh, are all available. Owner Mellon, uh, Mickey Rosenberg is about to retire, but has had a long history of uh, caring for your patients with you. Uh, we are ready and able uh, to assist when you have patients with symptoms. Uh, I don't anticipate anybody reading or looking at this slide, uh, but uh, for the learners on the screen and the fellows, this is a nice review article that just came out in the Journal of Neuroophthalmology, uh, talking about the, the myriad manifestations of various structural lesions. And it sort of reads like a what's what of neurologic disease, basically because uh, cancer in any part of the brain uh, can show up and present with various numbers, various different types of neurologic symptoms. But this is a nice review. It points out that perhaps up to 50% of patients who have some version of cancer inside their head will present with visual symptoms. Most of the time, they're going to be sort of vague uh, symptoms blurred and or double vision, some description of acuity or visual field loss, some objective findings, which might include afferent pupillary defect, ophthalmoplegia, um, and then on examination, things like swelling of the optic nerve, pallor of the optic nerve, uh, and or drooping eyelids. So the symptoms and the signs are going to be there. And the question is, how are you going to be able to recognize them? Here's a case to get us warmed up, a 39-year-old man who presents with just some brow pain, uh, worsening over three, four days and the development of double vision. Uh, as a public service announcement to all of you that don't remember doing this, uh, this is a third nerve palsy. You should all be able to recognize a third nerve palsy based on an eye that's out, a dilated pupil, drooping eyelid, uh, and then this eye wouldn't move in, up, or down. And in the day-to-day uh, -day life of any doctor, an acute third nerve palsy is an aneurysm until proven otherwise, specifically a posterior communicating artery aneurysm. Uh, 
we went through that ritual. Uh, we did CT MRI, we did a lumbar puncture, uh, the PAN workup, uh, and we were not able to disclose a cause for this people uh, involving third nerve palsy, which is very unusual uh, as it almost always has a cause. We wound up with a diagnosis that I hate, and I've, I've shared this diagnosis with a few of you uh, and patients here, something called the Telosa Hunt syndrome, which is an idiopathic inflammation of the cavernous sinus. Uh, we hate to make the diagnosis because we're almost often, almost always wrong. Uh, we gave him steroids, he got better, uh, which is relevant, of course, to his ultimate diagnosis. He ultimately developed more pain and more symptoms in the first division of the fifth cranial nerve. We repeated the workup uh, with another MRI scan, which was negative, so we have two down. Uh, and then three weeks later, he developed abdominal pain, had melanin, and had a, a bleed that led to an ICU admission, and ultimately a GI biopsy, which revealed uh, a malt B-cell lymphoma. And on his third set of MRI scans, uh, here's his first, here's his third, uh, you can see obvious involvement of multiple cranial nerves and the cavernous sinus. Uh, with his lymphoma. So this was an isolated presentation, not to you guys, but to, to us as uh, neuro-ophthalmologists of the third nerve palsy that turned out to be lymphoma. This is maybe my most important slide. It's sort of the post, the public uh, health uh, admonition of where I think you should all be in, uh, in the oncologist eye exam. Um, so the first and most important is being able to characterize uh, a complaint or visual symptom that a patient offers. And here's where you guys are gonna be overwhelmed by uh, people who are uh, constantly complaining about uh, things with their eyes and blurred vision and irritation, and are gonna to have to sort of sort through which is the patient that has a retina, optic nerve, brain problem, or significant surface disease that requires an ophthalmologist. The key words I think to listen for are uh, things like a patient describing their vision as dark, missing pieces, cloudy, loss of color, those are classic symptoms that warrant further attention. As I'll describe, I think it's reasonable for a non-ophthalmologist to make an attempt at visual field testing uh, with confrontation. I think it's reasonable for you to swing your light, uh, which is the afferent pupillary defect. It's a good screen for bad stuff. So if you pick up an afferent pupillary defect, which I'll show you, I think the obvious positive is the only important thing. I don't think even I am not comfortable excluding disease mostly because of subtle findings and symmetric findings just based on an afferent pupillary defect. Can you get to this point uh, with your ophthalmoscope? I dare say most of you cannot, uh, just because it's not something you do on a regular basis. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, as I'll mention down the road, uh, non-midriatic photography is gonna become an important part of the non-ophthalmologist eye exam. Uh, looking at the orbit, uh, is the eyelid changed in appearance? Is there an eye movement problem? Uh, and then, Obviously, can you elicit a complaint of double vision, which is important. Remember, blurred is not double. And the only double vision that we really care about is double vision that disappears if you close either eye, implying that the eyes are misaligned. So here is the relative afferent pupillary defect. Uh, what, we're, what we're doing is moving a light back and forth between the eyes. That pupil reacts nicely, as you can see on the right. Uh, the pupil on the left, you'll immediately notice, doesn't what, react quite as well. Uh, but the key is when we move the light back and forth between the two eyes, uh, you can see that the left pupil dilates as opposed to constricts, this indicating that this person clearly has a problem with retina optic nerve uh, on the left side causing that degree. And if you could screen for this in someone who has a vision complaint, uh, you might uh, recognize things that are more important than you thought. In terms of screening for visual field defects, I think my most important uh, reminder here to everybody is that it's always one eye at a time. It's always the patient sort of staring at your nose and you are in some fashion comparing quadrants left and right and up and down with fingers counting. There's no value to visual fields and waving your hands miles away from what the patient's looking at, concentrating on the central 30 degrees, presenting an odd number of fingers and, and trying to detect whether a patient is missing things right or left, top or bottom. Uh, remember that we're going to see a lot of disease at the skull base and particularly in the cella. And we'll talk about uh, tumors around the chiasm in just a moment. Uh, but it's really just the happenstance of the pituitary gland being located just under the intracranial optic nerve, uh, which rises about 45 degrees to become the chiasm and, and therefore is uh, ripe for compressive lesions. As we move past the chiasm, remember that everything is in both eyes. So you have to identify, if you're going to identify a brain problem, 
it's always going to be in both eyes in some form of a hemianopia as demonstrated here. And I'll, I'll talk about these in just a minute. Uh, but the key is recognizing temporal defects or the outside or chiasm. And then everything else is going to be right or left and uh, similar in both eyes. Uh, just a quick reminder of our differential diagnosis of intracranial neoplasms around the chiasm, pituitary adenoma, meningioma, this not in your world, an aneurysm. Uh, these are the types of visual field defects patients with that get. These are called Goldman visual fields, which is sort of a kinetic perimetry. And you can see missing areas to the patients outside of the left eye, outside of the right eye, a bitemporal hemianopia. And in this patient's particular history, these photos go with this patient only a relatively mild amount of disc pallor, which uh, we would certainly not fault anybody for not noticing. Uh, and this patient may have only come to attention because of complaints of loss of peripheral vision uh, and the identified visual field defect. Uh, for the most part, we're looking for pituitary adenomas and meningiomas uh, in adults uh, and in children. Uh, it's a slightly different uh, differential diagnosis, which includes uh, chiasmal gliomas and uh, cranial pharyngiomas. As we move uh, posteriorly, we'll recognize visual field defects very commonly in association with both metastatic and primary intracranial disease. They have characteristic features that medical students learn, uh, and you all forget eventually. Uh, remember, temporal lobe visual field defects, it's usually the superior part of the visual pathway, the so-called pie in the sky. Parietal lobe defects are most easily recognized because they're associated with other deficits. Remember, it's hard to have something wrong with your parietal lobe and not have other neurologic symptoms. Uh, and then uh, most interesting to ophthalmologists and, and to you as per people on the per front line is occipital lobe visual field defect or occipital lobe presentations can indeed be I completely isolated visual presentations. So with this patient uh, with these visual fields here, which are computerized perimetry, right homonymous hemianopia, may have only come in complaining of something's not right with my right peripheral vision or the vision in my right eye. It's, it's darker or something, almost never recognizing the left eye. And until you did either your visual fields or hopefully port an MRI scan, you might not have recognized the, the occipital lobe lesion. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here just to switch to efferent mode uh, and not again to scare you, but to remind you uh, you know, the third, fourth, and sixth nerves, third and fourth in the midbrain, sixth in the pons, have complicated relationships with uh, other intraaxial structures. Uh, the cavernous sinus, which is a very, very common place in skull base for a metastatic disease, uh, often involves third, fourth, uh, sixth cranial nerve. Again, as our case indicated, this, our first case presented, lymphoma finds this area very commonly. Uh, and then once you're in the orbit, uh, again, complicated a uh, uh, number of nerves and different symptoms that patients can have because of primarily spread or extrinsic compression uh, of the orbital structures. And, and we look, when we, we examine patients, we look around for pupil abnormalities, eyelid, motility, you know, what are the functions of the different cranial nerves? We have a way of measuring proptosis with ex-ophthalmometry. There's a whole host of things that we will do as ophthalmologists to sort of characterize uh, various efferent problems. We already saw one case with a third nerve palsy. I'll, I'll show the, these two examples uh, to emphasize two important points. And you might meet the, this guy in the center photo in your clinic and, and not really make a relevant observation when he's complaining of something's not right with his vision or hopefully double vision, which you recognize disappears when you close one eye, uh, when he closes one eye. The reason is, as you can see in this top picture, when he looks up, the eyes are looking at different places. That's the cause of the double vision and it would go away if he occluded either eye. The, the, this is a more subtle third nerve palsy maybe than the obvious one where the lid's down and out. And, and I'd urge you to try to make the observation doesn't go up and doesn't go down. Uh, so a vertical separation of the eyes that is the opposite looking up and down is a good clue to a third nerve palsy. And then there's another important finding where the lid does funny things when the patient moves their eye that's called aberrant regeneration of the third nerve. It's sort of a partially healed third nerve that feels in a, uh, in a mishap kind of way. And you can see the lid is doing sort of the wrong thing when the eye looks down. Uh, and that's an important clue to a compressive lesion. Uh, for six nerve palsy, generally easier to recognize. Again, the, the patients will look esotropic or their eyes will look crossed uh, and there'll be an incomplete. This is probably the easier example. This is bilateral and incomplete movement of the right eye to the right, left eye uh, to the left. 
Uh, and uh, again, when you're just watching a patient in your office, you should be able to feel pretty comfortable uh, moving the right eye, uh, watching the patient and the inability to move the right eye to the right. Uh, unlike third and sixth nerve palsies, fourth nerve palsies, the superior oblique was sort of down and in movement, very hard to recognize on uh, clinical examination. Uh, and therefore you should not try to judge whether someone has a fourth nerve palsy based on uh, that aspect of their eye movements. All right, here's another case. Um, and uh, this is a, a handwritten note that I got from a family member of the patient uh, thanking me for expertly diagnosing uh, his vision problem. And the miraculous thing about his presentation was that his vision was actually getting better. Uh, he'd worn glasses his whole life and suddenly he didn't need his glasses and he had some personality changes. And um, the, the ophthalmologist will recognize, and this is an, an example of someone situation where a non-expert would not get to the right diagnosis quick enough, that this patient's myopia went away because he had a hyperopic shift and again, not to bore you with the details, but when people get nearsighted, their eyes too big, when they get farsighted, their eyes too small. Uh, and this turns out to be a fairly classic symptom of papilledema where the back of the eye, and I'll show you some pictures, flattens a bit and patient's prescription shifts from nearsighted uh, towards farsightedness. And in this case, uh, he got rid of his glasses, also had a personality change because he had a, a giant uh, oligodendroglioma and presented with papilledema. And this, the swelling of the nerve actually pushes the eye forward and causes nearsightedness to go away. And that was his uh, isolated presentation along with the personality changes from the frontal lobe tumor. Um, this is not him, but you can see here is the example of the back of the eye being flattened by papilledema. These are two, three examples. These two meningiomas, this a glioblastoma that had isolated presentation with papilledema without other neurologic symptoms. So being able to recognize papilledema is important. Fairly easy for us most of the time as neuro-ophthalmologists to recognize swollen discs. Again, can you get this view in clinic and make a decision? We are now uh, heavily dependent on a technology called optical coherence tomography, uh, which takes these cross-sectional images uh, of the back of the eye uh, to demonstrate optic nerve elevation, the curvature of the globe forward, uh, and other characteristics that help us identify papilledema. The vast majority of patients with papilledema are, ace, are not asymptomatic. In other words, they're gonna have headaches or other symptoms. So listening to your patient here is important. Uh, a peculiar symptom called pulse synchronous tinnitus or a swishing sound, that's pulse synchronous, is classic. And the main visual symptom of papilledema is not vision loss, but something called transient visual obscurations where position changes, a patient stands up quickly, their vision grays out or has a fleeting uh, darkness to it that quickly resolves, not 90 seconds or two minutes like amaurosis, but just a fleeting change in vision. Um, <clears throat> it depends uh, on what study you read and what year it was done. Uh, about 30 to 60, somewhere between 30 and 60 percent of patients uh, have papilledema as part of their presentation of an interstructural lesion. Again, less and less in the MRI era, and interestingly, much more common as in the two, three cases I showed with the oligo and the two meningiomas. Uh, common with benign tumors because they're less likely to cause symptoms uh, and uh, more common in tumors uh, below the tentorium. A couple of other interesting papilledema side notes. Uh, remember, papilledema can be a manifestation of non-structural elevation of intracranial pressure. Uh, this is a patient with uh, transverse sinus thrombosis as part of a hypercoagulability presentation uh, of cancer. Uh, here's her papilledema and then another a fun fact that you can get a sixth nerve palsy just from having papilledema without anything pressing or affecting uh, the sixth nerve from presumably tension on the sixth nerve as it crosses into the cavernous sinus. So transverse sinus uh, thrombosis. Uh, and then there are actually mechanisms by which uh, this patient with an ependymoma, this with a meningocele after surgery, uh, in which spinal cord tumors and or lesions through proteinaceous fluid getting into the spinal fluid can cause papilledema. So it's not always uh, stuff in the top of your head. And then other uh, ophthalmoscopy findings, uh, again, uh, papilledema here, optic atrophy here. This is atrophy with something called shunt vessels, which is an important finding uh, to us to indicate a compressive lesion. Uh, hemorrhages in the retina that might be seen with leukemia. This is a retinal detachment that could be seen uh, with a, a metastatic tumor. Uh, and then uh, here again, papilledema. Uh, I, we have come to recognize uh, as educators of medical students and interacting with our colleagues that uh, 
it's hard uh, to expect non-experts to do ophthalmoscopy. Uh, and I think we're gonna be entering an, an interesting era. I just put this study up here as a reminder uh, about the uh, increasing prevalence of non midriatic cameras. I don't know that they'll be in the oncologist's office. I expect that they'll be in a uh, little post throughout our hospital where you can send somebody for a photo and or uh, potentially in the emergency room as a way of screening. You can get uh, this level of photograph. These are obviously taken with real cameras. Uh, with a non midriatic camera, which uh, saves the whole effort of you all trying to do it. Um, <clears throat> this more of a uh, message to uh, us as the vision loss doctors that to recognize that cancer really mimics many different presentations uh, that of common conditions. Uh, for a neuro-ophthalmologist, one of the most common is uh, assuming the patient's older, as many are with cancer, and they have a sudden change in vision, and we see something in their optic nerve. Uh, there's a very common idiopathic condition called ischemic optic neuropathy uh, that overlaps uh, a lot with various uh, spread of cancers to the eye diagnoses. Uh, and then in the unexplained vision loss category, uh, recognizing a localization to the retina or the optic nerve that de demands more uh, workup. Uh, breast and lung are by far the most common primary tumors to cause mischief in and around the eye. Uh, and then right behind that is lymphoma and the many hats it wears, which I'll, I'll show you as we get towards the end of the talk. Uh, most of the time, as in our case, it's high quality directed neuroimaging, lumbar punctures, and uh, collaborating, collaborating with uh, us as experts in trying to identify the cause of the problem. Here's a, a quick tour th towards uh, through metastatic disease. Uh, for sure, uh, breast and lung, the most common. The choroid here, this is a metastatic uh, lung tumor to the choroid. Uh, we can, again, easily see these. This patient would present, presumably, with a missing the bottom half of their vision because the top half of the vision. Uh, sometimes these lesions can be seen on a CAT scan or MRI scan. Uh, and then if it's going to be a metastatic tumor to the anterior segment or iris, in this case, uh, the patient is going to have, uh, obviously, symptoms of blurred vision, often have glaucoma, uh, a red eye, and evidence of inflammation. Uh, here's another example of a metastatic breast tumor to the choroid, a uh, patient of uh, my colleague Lee Jampol. Uh, you just see these beautiful images that we can take with optical coherence tomography, uh, demonstrating the large tumor in the choroid, uh, fluid under the retina, uh, and these can be uh, treated most commonly with radiation and or occasionally intravitreal medications. Here's another uh, version of the presentation similar to our patient with papilledema. This patient had a sun hemorrhage and a tumor that actually turned out to be a carcinoid tumor metastatic to the uh, lateral rectus muscle. And her, her visual symptoms were the result of her, again, her eye being indented, which you can see obviously here. When we look ophthalmoscopically at patients like that, we see these findings called choroidal folds, which are very common, again, uh, sometimes with papilledema, but often with uh, rapidly developing orbital mass lesions because the curvature of the eye is lost and the retina is thrown into folds on the flatter surface of the back of the eye. Metastases to the optic nerve itself are relatively rare, about 5% in one series. Breast, lung, bowel, uh, of course, the interesting thing is that many of them have unknown primaries and will present with vision loss. Uh, this is a patient, for instance, who ultimately turned out to have esophageal carcinoma metastatic to the optic nerve. Uh, again, for the ophthalmologist, mimicking a lot of our common optic neuropathy problems, ischemic optic neuropathy, optic neuritis, posterior ischemic optic neuropathy, uh, are all versions of, uh, we thought it was a stroke in the optic nerve, but in fact, it's tumor. Uh, and in that situation, these are generally identified in uh, salvage attempts with uh, steroids and radiation. But there are other ways in which the optic nerve can be affected uh, in cancer patients, uh, particularly extrinsic compression, uh, and in the setting of carcinomatous meningitis, which has the ability uh, to affect uh, the penetrating peel vessels that are important to optic nerve function and blood flow, and, and thereby either through that mechanism or constriction, uh, cause vision loss. Uh, here's another patient, a 28-year-old man who complains of a smudge in the vision. Again, there's that buzzword that uh, should point us to something other than uh, needs eyeglasses or teardrops for dry eyes, something's missing. I uh, noted a little bit of pain in eye movements. We did a visual field, demonstrated uh, a central scotoma, and he was labeled as having optic neuritis, which is the uh, manifestation in the eye of multiple sclerosis, and uh, this is a good history for that. It turns out he was no light perception by four weeks later, 
uh, and there's a, a large tumor here in the ethmoid sinus that you can see invades uh, the orbital apex, causing a compressive optic neuropathy and the pain on eye movements. He ultimately developed proctosis and difficulty moving his eyes. And this was actually a metastatic Ewing sarcoma uh, to the uh, orbit and sinus that presented with uh, optic neuropathy. Carcinomatous meningitis, uh, the hallmark, of course, uh, as you all know better than I, multiple cranial nerve involvement, breast and lung, very common. But here, the subset of patients with carcinomatous meningitis, many of them have optic neuropathy, and it can be acute or subacute. Some of it is just a manifestation of elevated intracranial pressure. Many patients, uh, uh, again, up to 40% of patients with large brain tumors have no uh, papilledema. So the disc appearance does not make the diagnosis. Uh, and again, we, we work hard towards making this diagnosis with our neurology colleagues in identifying abnormal cells and protein um, uh, in the spinal fluid. And we can sometimes see imaging abnormalities, uh, like enhancement of the optic nerve sheath as seen on these MRI scans. Obviously the, the calling card here is the papilledema uh, and or other thickening of the optic nerve. And there are any, a number of different ways that carcinomatous meningitis can affect vision and optic nerve uh, function through uh, compression, uh, ischemia and or uh, involvement of crowding the optic canal. Uh, the story for brain metastases again, uh, I think all of these things are going to be easily recognized uh, by you all when you're seeing a patient uh, in the setting of some symptoms. And I imagine there are some uh, patients who get routinely screened for metastatic disease. As in that first slide I showed uh, of uh, Andy Lee's uh, recent review of neuroptomic manifestations, most of these patients are going to have visual field defects and headaches and other symptoms. Again, breast, lung. Um, here we, we bring in some um, kidney and melanoma as uh, other common uh, sources of brain metastases. Uh, and the classic, of course, are the multiple ring enhancing lesions at the uh, gray white matter junction. Uh, I think obviously, if you're seeing a patient with cancer who has a description of something that sounds like a hemianopia and your uh, tests indicate that, you're going to uh, order a visual field, uh, I'm sorry, order an MRI scan. I think I'd add that the, the other quality that I would uh, think is important in patients who have uh, metastatic disease is a positive uh, quality to the symptom. Is it uh, flashing? Are there swirls or other things uh, that would clue me into uh, wanting to look for a metastatic disease? Anything that's sort of triggering either release or potentially ictal type phenomena uh, would want me to look for brain metastases. And uh, the final variant on uh, vision loss in the cancer patient, re very rare. This is a once every couple of years, even for an expert to see. Uh, a 58 year old complained of decreased vision and here flickering lights in both eyes. And again, positive visual phenomena or flashing that accompanies vision loss uh, has uh, both brain and retina significance. Uh, in this case, uh, a small cell cancer of the lung uh, was his diagnosis. He had reduced visual acuity uh, and a very classic pattern, again, that an ophthalmologist would know to answer on a test called mid-peripheral visual field defects that generally indicate uh, uh, rod dysfunction as opposed to cone dysfunction. Uh, and this is a presentation of an acute photoreceptor dysfunction, uh, which is typical of paraneoplastic or cancer-associated retinopathy. Uh, a well-described uh, and well-known entity, uh, particularly with antibodies to recoverin, that's believed to be the offending uh, agent in most uh, patients. Uh, all, over 20 other antibodies have been described. There's a version of this that isn't in cancer patients that's called autoimmune, autoimmune retinopathy. I, my message here would be to think about it in unexplained vision loss. And uh, you know, we will go after this with an ERG, an electroretinogram, uh, and some of the other subtle findings, but it can be a very difficult diagnosis to make. Uh, perhaps responsive to the usual take away the antibody treatments, steroids, IVIG, and plasmapheresis. Uh, and uh, in the end, uh, a difficult diagnosis to make uh, and to treat. There's a unique version of this in melanoma patients. Uh, unlike uh, carcinoma, uh, cancer-associated retinopathy, uh, melanoma-associated retinopathy is generally later in the disease, so they often have metastatic disease, whereas for the oat cell lung cancer type patient or the non squamous cell oat, uh, patient with cancer-associated retinopathy, it can be a presenting manifestation. Uh, again, flickering lights, difficulty with night vision. It's a, a very interesting entity because it specifically has a propensity to affect bipolar cells. Uh, and again, some improvement in removing metastases or IVIG, but 
Uh, these again are recognized by subtle symptoms. Uh, and finally, there is a perineoplastic optic neuropathy. Uh, the classic is the CRENT5 version, which often presents with cerebellar symptoms. Uh, remember, there are other important brain stem uh, perineoplastic syndromes, particularly Yo and Hue, which can present with uh, cerebellar and or eye movement abnormalities and nystagmus. And again, the exam is uh, typical with subacute vision loss, vitreous cells, uh, and uh, a host of other neurologic symptoms. So a very specific can be tested for optic neuropathy uh, that we should think about again, uh, commonly in small cell cancers. Uh, <clears throat> nice review article of uh, perineoplastic syndromes. We touched on the three, I think, most important ones. Uh, I'll remind the audience about uh, opsoclonus, myoclonus being an important presentation. That's sort of a rapid shaking of the eye. We call it saccata mania. The eye just keeps dancing as a presentation of childhood neuroblastoma. Uh, and then there are eye movement versions, sort of the Lambert Eaton and myasthenia gravis as uh, perineoplastic syndromes that can accompany uh, various uh, cancers. For uh, orbital metastases, uh, again, these are going to be mass lesion presentations that are uh, generally going to be uh, highlighted by motility issues and proptosis and or optic nerve involvement. Uh, I showed you the patient who had vision changes with choroidal folds, and they, they represent a small but significant presentation uh, 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 orbital tumors. Uh, here are some examples. Again, so you, you can obviously tell this patient's eye is not moving normally, it's sort of down and out. Uh, because it's proptotic and not blinking, he has a corneal ulcer. Uh, and you can see this is just an orbit full of uh, metastatic lung cancer uh, as the cause for his uh, presentation. Uh, doesn't, uh, it doesn't pick what it affects. It could be optic nerve fat or muscles. Here's isolated uh, metastases. I'll just point it out here. Not a great MRI scan of uh, breast to the uh, medial rectus muscle. Uh, and again, uh, breast and lung common. We bring prostate in uh, because of its propensity to reach the orbital bones and cavernous sinus. So prostate's a, an actor in the metastatic orbital disease tumor. And here's such an example of a hyperostatic lesion involving uh, the cavernous sinus and orbit. And you can see the patient presented if you concentrate first on this picture, sort of with a bulging eye with exposed conjunctiva, uh, doesn't look to the left well, doesn't look down well, doesn't look to the right well, doesn't look up. So a third and sixth nerve palsy from metastatic prostate cancer to the cavernous sinus. Uh, myeloma and plasma cytomas can present in the cavernous sinus. So I'll point that out as an unusual cancer manifestation and affecting motility. Uh, and then uh, three, two other points to make. Remember that patients with various types of skin cell, particular skin cancer, particularly uh, squamous cell around their eye, uh, its favorite way of becoming nettlesome to the patient and the oncologist and ophthalmologist is through perineural, perineural spread. So we'll see patients that present with uh, multiple cranial nerve palsies that have a vague history of a squamous cell cancer being removed from their uh, lid or cheek years ago, and uh, it made its way back from the fifth to the cavernous sinus. For bilateral six nerve palsies, remember the unique presentation of nasopharyngeal carcinoma because of its position near the clivus uh, and chordomas as an etiology. Okay, changing gears here. Um, uh, some of the most horrible looking fundus exams can be seen in uh, patients, unfortunately children in particular who have leukemia. Uh, so this is uh, a 12 year old boy with leukemic uh, infiltration of his optic nerve. Uh, obvious both on MRI scan. Again, here's the normal right eye and the left eye you can see it's just the optic nerve is completely infiltrated along with the subretinal space. Um, this is a cherry red spot from ischemic involvement of blood vessels. Uh, and this is obviously a catastrophe which is not recoverable from. Uh, more subtle manifestations, again, the kind of things that you might wander on with your ophthalmoscope in patients with leukemia would be intraretinal hemorrhages and particularly sort of white-centered intraretinal hemorrhages as a, a, a manifestation of a leukemic retinopathy. Um, <clears throat> for lymphoma, uh, very similar to carcinomatous meningitis as in the patient that I presented. Uh, we'll, we'll show some other examples of how lymphoma can uh, be involved in the eye and optic nerve. Uh, once you recognize leukemia in the optic nerve and retina, then it, this is a critical diagnosis that uh, demands some type of uh, salvage and uh, radiation treatment to try and save the eye. 
the spectrum of what happens uh, when leukemia gets to the any part of the eye uh, is, uh, as you can imagine, quite varied and varied. And uh, I would, uh, of course, you all know this, urge anybody that has a patient with leukemia and vision symptoms and or changes in the eye appearance uh, to seek out our help, uh, either because it's in the retina, choroidal masses, infiltrating the vitreous, in the anterior chamber, in the orbit, uh, it, it can be anywhere and it's critical to recognize. Uh, rarely the presenting signs of leukemia. Uh, again, um, in the setting of leukemia, all the other things that happen, anemia, thrombocytopenia, hyperviscosity, can have ophthalmic manifestations. Uh, and unfortunately, we often see this uh, presented and discussed when uh, somebody has a recurrence, maybe because of poorly treated sanctuary cells that have found their way into the central nervous system and are present uh, with uh, an, a leukemic presentation in the eye. Uh, because it's a uh, common cancer in children, we often encounter it there. Uh, optic nerve invasion is relatively rare. It has a very poor prognosis. And again, if you recognize leukemic uh, optic neuropathy and vision loss, it's an emergent indication for radiation. Uh, and a final case of, of devastating bilateral case of, and here again, the findings are pretty subtle. You can see the disc swelling on MRI scan. You can see the enhancing uh, involvement of the sheath uh, and uh, at least around uh, the back of the eye uh, where leukemia has occurred. Change gears here now. So this is an elderly man who presented with uh, subacute or acute over three or four days vision loss in his left eye. Uh, I show a picture of his left eye because it's an acutely swollen optic nerve uh, and a picture that would be consistent, for instance, with ischemic Please optic nerve. Bye girls, a, I love you. A common, uh, the most common cause for vision loss and uh, an acute change in an elderly patient would be this ischemic optic neuropathy. Um, he became immediately atypical when he progressed over two weeks. Uh, and then with a series of imaging studies, you can see that uh, he has enhancement of his intracranial optic nerve, which actually extends back to the chiasm and around to the track. He progressed, these findings were not present on his initial MRI scan, ultimately to no light perception and an optic nerve biopsy uh, confirmed the presence of B cell lymphoma. This was the only place uh, this patient ever had uh, lymphoma you know, in his body or brain was in his left optic nerve. Uh, these are rare cases uh, and uh, may overlap with the primary central nervous system lymphoma that we'll talk about in a minute and its retinal manifestations, but you can have isolated presentations of an acute optic neuropathy in elderly patients uh, because of B cell. And this is a, a nice review article uh, that uh, talks about the myriad manifestations of lymphoma in the optic nerve. Much more common is uh, lymphoma and its overlap uh, with orbital mass lesions and orbital inflammatory disease. Uh, so here's a 65-year-old man who noticed double vision when he looked to the right. Uh, so here's his right eye. Um, this is his grossly abnormal medial rectus muscle, which you can see here. Has this very characteristic, uh, assumes and hugs the curvature of the globe, uh, which is typical of lymphoma. Uh, and here's an intraoperative uh, view of his uh, very enlarged medial rectus muscle, which we biopsied. Uh, and again, a malt B cell lymphoma that presented with an isolated presentation uh, to the medial rectus muscle. Uh, he has been expertly treated here uh, with radiation uh, for a cure now for many years. <clears throat> uh, so again, for lymphoma and the eye muscles, a uh, nice review article. A uh, very common uh, presenting sign with eye movement limitation, drooping eyelid. Uh, these patients are going to present with double vision. Uh, and again, the, the orbit can both be part of systemic lymphoma and a sanctuary for isolated presentation of marginal zone uh, lymphomas uh, that we will see as ophthalmologists and uh, manage with you as oncologists. Lymphoma gets really interesting as we start to think about what it's capable of doing in the eye itself. Uh, so this is not something that you'd be able to see, but something that we see with a slit lamp, and that's something called uveitis or cells floating in the eye and the vitreous. Uh, so there's a, a broad overlap of both inflammatory, infectious, and neoplastic conditions that can present with cellular reaction in the eye or uveitis. Uh, and we may see that as complaints of hazy vision or floaters. Uh, we may be able to see that inflammation in the front of the eye as in this picture here, uh, or in the back of the eye here where the sort of uh, cloudy appearance uh, to the vitreous and a retina uh, from, uh, in this case, uh, lymphoma. Uh, 
Uh, it's typically a, a B cell lymphoma, of course, for the primary central nervous system lymphoma that seems to have a unique tropism uh, for the retina. Uh, and we'll talk about two versions of this. One that's a primary vitreal retinal lymphoma that that's the one that's isolated to the retina and uh, occasionally also to the CNS and occasionally together uh, where we'd recognize and manage this together. Uh, and then there's actually a version of lymphoma uh, that is systemic lymphoma that, uh, if you will, uh, presents in an isolated fashion in the eye. And that generally be would be generally located in the choroid, not in the surface of the retina. Uh, and I'll show you an examples of that. So the, the uveal lymphoma is generally part of uh, disseminated disease, whereas the vitreal retinal lymphoma is generally part of the primary central nervous system lymphoma. So uh, here's a, a case of uh, Lee Jampols, and uh, I'll share pictures here from my colleagues, uh, Dr. Jampol and Dr. Goldstein. Gold, uh, Deborah Goldstein is the head of our uveitis service, and she sees a lot of patients with lymphoma, mostly because she's getting them as patients with uh, potentially uveitis and recognizing that it's not primary inflammation, but primarily lymphoma involving the eye. And again, uh, you know, you're wandering into this eye with an ophthalmoscope, you're never going to sort of see these subtle retinal findings. Uh, the other tests we use, we're able to look at the eye with autofluorescence. Uh, and this is a test uh, called fluorescent angiography, where you can see these uh, isolated enhancing lesions uh, that are present in the retina of this patient with primary vitreal lymphoma. Uh, once again, our optical coherence tomography. So these are every, we take hundreds of these pictures every day, which give us this almost subcellular view of the retinal layers with optical coherence tomography. This was the optic nerve. We're taking a cross section of the retina. Uh, you can see the individual uh, layers. Uh, I'll point out that you can see the vitreous. Every one of these are isolated vitreous cells, uh, which are lymphoma cells. Uh, this band of hyperreflective substance that seems to be bordered by Brooks membrane separating from the choroid. This is the vitreal lymphoma, the vitreal retinal lymphoma that in this case is in the retina. Uh, here's another example again of uh, the sort of cloudy whitening of the retina. Uh, this, this line indicates the place where we took this OCT picture. Here you can see sort of a trans, the whole uh, thickness of the retina uh, is involved uh, by this lymphoma, this change. Uh, other examples, a nice review article that just that Deborah just wrote that just came out sort of depicting uh, some of the unusual findings. Again, uh, subretinal infiltrates, uh, these uh, hyperreflective bands that are present uh, here's uh, before and after treatment uh, with uh, intravitreal methotrexate. <clears throat> here's lymphoma literally on the surface of the retina and various manifestations of this vitreal retinal lymphoma. And again, here, uh, these patients uh, may uh, come your way because you're managing the uh, central nervous system part of the lymphoma. Uh, more likely, they're going to come our way and we're going to need your help uh, managing them. Uh, there are fairly classic um, diffuse bilateral uh, lobar lesions that are seen on MRI scan, uh, not with avid enhancement and a very unique spectroscopy signal. Uh, so we know how and when to look for these uh, and uh, trigger uh, neuro-oncology uh, and combine treatment of uh, vitreal retinal lymphoma because of its involvement of the central nervous system. And then here's the other version. This is the systemic lymphoma that's involving the eye uh, through a uveal extension. Uh, I'll point you uh, to this lesion or area. This is uh, before and after treatment. Uh, and you can see in the choroid here, remember we were looking at pictures before of the retinal layers. Here we're now in the choroid and you can see this lesion before uh, and then after treatment, it sort of uh, disappears uh, in its substantive form. And ultimately after this patient was completely treated, you can see this sort of devolves into these atrophic lesions again, which if you look at the retinal blood vessels, are clearly under the retina uh, and not a uh, manifestation of intraretinal disease, uh, which would uh, obscure the vessels and make the retina look white. So the treatment here is uh, uh, kind of depends on whether it's just the eye and or is the central nervous system involved. And uh, I won't uh, pretend to be an expert on uh, either version of it, uh, but just to remind you that in isolated uh, ophthalmic presentations, uh, there is uh, a, a way of treating this fairly successfully locally with intravitreal injections of either methotrexate or rituximab. Uh, low dose radiation, also very effective. Uh, and then again, with central nervous system involvement, uh, 
uh, that's going to require uh, obviously systemic chemotherapy, uh, potentially uh, radiotherapy. And uh, there are several good uh, recent review articles on the combined treatment approach to these diseases. Uh, and here's an example, uh, again, uh, not subtle when you're looking at photographs to see all this white fluffy stuff that doesn't belong, uh, including these isolated lesions and this obscuration. Uh, this is after treatment with uh, intravenous, I'm sorry, intravitreal methotrexate. Uh, and you can see how that uh, resolves the lymphoma in the eye. <clears throat> and then finally on to uh, treatment side effects. Um, uh, here again, uh, and not to be uh, disparaging of uh, the world of eye care providers that are out there. Um, and uh, I, I pointed this out in the beginning of my talk, I'll come back to it, particularly as it relates to side effects or complications of treatment. Uh, I would urge you, uh, as you, as you field your cancer patients and their symptoms of uh, change in vision or some type of discomfort and or something's not right with their eye, uh, the default, I don't think, can be checked with your eye doctor. Um, the, the important thing to recognize is that the spectrum of code eye doctors that are out there is quite wide. Um, there are a lot of uh, uh, wonderful, talented optometrists that provide probably eye care for many of you on the screen that are good at eyeglasses and recognizing uh, routine eye problems that may not be as tuned, tuned into cancer, cancer treatments, its manifestations. Uh, even the vast majority of ophthalmologists that are practicing routine eye care and eye surgery in the community may not be turned tuned into this. So don't, don't assume because you made the uh, decision to check with your eye doctor as your treatment plan uh, that that's going to be adequate. I'd encourage you to use experts that might be familiar with uh, some of the side effects of treatment, whether it's radiation or chemotherapy or uh, the new biologic treatments. <clears throat> uh, so we'll start with the, the biologics. You know, this in the last decade has opened up a, a host of uh, really unique ophthalmic and neuro-ophthalmic uh, presentations. The bottom line is that they all can do a lot of different things <clears throat> and that most of them can be successfully treated by the, the eye side effects by discontinuing them and using the anti-inflammatory things that uh, you have triggered by unleashing the inflammatory system. Uh, some of the, the, the more dramatic ones, um, and we'll talk specifically about press in a minute, uh, but eyelid and orbital swelling, pretty much any itis, and I put itis because we have blepharitis, we have keratitis, we have uveitis, we have episcleritis, we have scleritis. Anybody, anybody who has a red eye and obvious inflammation around their eye um, and is on any type of particularly immune checkpoint inhibitor uh, should be evaluated by ophthalmologists, neuro-ophthalmologists, or uveitis specialists. People are familiar with these drugs and their myriad ophthalmic manifestations nerve swelling, orbital inflammation, you name it, uh, and there have been a host of reports. Uh, these have all been reviewed in various articles. I think this is a particularly good review article, um, particularly about neuro-ophthalmology neuro patients. Um, it, it's a small percentage, uh, but uh, given the number of patients that are now on these drugs, uh, we are starting to encounter them with optic neuritis, neuroretinitis, a temporal arteritis-like presentation, myasthenia-like presentation and orbital inflammation uh, type uh, symptom, uh, all very common. Uh, pembrolizumab, uh, perhaps the most common in this series that was reviewed for causing uh, particularly orbital and neurophthalmic uh, symptoms, uh, complete resolution of symptoms generally when you stop the drug and or use steroids. Uh, and then uh, a very recent paper uh, in the journal Neurology that spoke specifically about cranial nerve involvement by checkpoint inhibitors uh, and their symptoms, and actually a third, and they're very common to involve the optic nerve uh, and uh, the eighth nerve. And in their series, about a third of patients had persisting deficits. So uh, not something to not think about in your patients. Um, here's uh, a case uh, of ours uh, here at Northwestern that uh, was indeed pembrolizumab related that presented with double vision and isolated myositis or inflammation of the lateral rectus muscle, which you can see here, looks a lot like that lymphoma picture where it kind of hugs and curves the back of the eye. Does not look like thyroid disease because it involves the tendon. So thyroid disease, when it swells the muscle, only involves the belly and spares the tendon. Uh, so you can see this is a more typical of an orbital inflammatory presentation on a patient uh, on pembrolizumab. Uh, and then a, a patient, uh, 
uh, who presented uh, on Turalio uh, for a giant cell synovial tumor as a case of Shira's uh, that she shared with me that presented actually with bilateral disc edema. Uh, we don't use the term papilledema because particularly even in this case, opening pressure was not high. So the exact mechanism for the disc swelling, whether it's inflammatory, uh, what caused this patient's headaches is unclear. Um, she did not have eye opening pressure. The medication was discontinued uh, and the disc swelling resolved. So we're, we're starting to see a fair number of these patients with various types of inflammation. Uh, I don't expect anyone to look at this slide. Uh, I'll just put it out there as a public service announcement that basically any of the poisons that you put your patients on, uh, any and all of them have been reported to have a host of various ophthalmic and neurophthalmic manifestations. Uh, a lot of them are front of the eye and uh, surface disease. Uh, many of them uh, are brain related, uh, but uh, again, the list goes on and on for potential uh, ophthalmic and neurophthalmic side effects. So please use our expertise if you have uh, patients complaining of unusual side effects in the setting of chemotherapy. Uh, some of the uh, more interesting ones, this is the classic uh, tamoxifen crystalline retinopathy for patients that are on long-term tamoxifen uh, who develop this uh, blurred vision and crystalline re uh, retinopathy. Uh, interferon and methotrexate both have uh, very unique uh, disc edema and acute vision loss presentations uh, that I uh, wanted to highlight. Uh, <clears throat> remember that uh, this uh, entity, uh, well known in various settings of posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome, uh, is important to be familiar with, not so much as a uh, direct manifestation of cancer, but uh, often in patients that have uh, been treated recently with chemotherapy, uh, particularly with leukemias, uh, particularly uh, in uh, patients that are on immune suppressive drugs, they can develop uh, posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome. Very alarming. You go from fine to blind, uh, cortically blind here again, because it has a propensity uh, for the posterior brain. Uh, because of this breakdown of the blood barrier, brain, blood brain barrier, resulting in vasogenic edema uh, and a sudden uh, vision loss uh, presentation. Um, also known as uh, reversible uh, RPL, reversible posterior leukoencephalopathy, only described in the last 20 years. Uh, patients have seizures and mental status changes, uh, and again, uh, particularly uh, cytotoxic agents as triggers. Uh, cytarabine and tacrolimus uh, are common uh, settings in which we think about it. Tacrolimus also has an optic neuropathy as a side mark. Uh, and again, uh, a very uh, typical presentation based on the mental status changes, headache, blood pressure changes, and the classic MRI scan. Remember that the terrible things that you have to do to patients to make them better often causes immune suppression. Uh, this is a patient who actually had both AIDS uh, and Kaposi's and was treated with uh, 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 chemotherapy and uh, presented with a nocardia abscess. This is a nocardia abscess that presented uh, with a, a third nerve palsy and obviously uh, was uh, an agonal event for him. Uh, remember that uh, herpes, varicella, and simplex, as well as toxosyphilis uh, and tuberculosis, all love the eyeball and the retina. Um, we have a, a very well-recognized re, well entity called acute retinal necrosis in which we can identify it very classically by ophthalmoscopy, test for it by testing for viral particles in the anterior chamber, uh, and have lots of success, success treating it. Uh, it occurs de novo, but certainly in, in immunosuppressed uh, patients. Uh, and then uh, for our last topic, uh, here's a, a patient who had an, a neuroblastoma, an olfactory growth neuroblastoma, uh, and of course, uh, ended up uh, with radiation over 50 gray to his paranasal sinuses, uh, presented with acute vision loss and optic disc swelling. Uh, these are not his MRI scans, but ultimately was found to have um, <clears throat> enhanced, but both primary T1 bright signal and enhancement of the optic nerve. Uh, and uh, he was identified to have radiation optic neuropathy. Uh, another nice uh, recent paper about uh, the imaging findings in patients with radionecrosis of the optic nerve or chiasm. Uh, we recognize uh, that it's a very much delayed response, never before four to six months, usually 18 months to three years after a dose of at least uh, 50 gray, uh, sometimes seen with large dose, single doses of radiation, 
uh, and uh, for the most part, severe and irreversible vision loss. Uh, almost always can detect findings on an MRI scan. I'll show you another example in a minute. Uh, and <clears throat> uh, with it, some enhancement of a very discrete segment of the optic nerve. Uh, unfortunately, um, there is not much we're gonna be able to do for these patients. Whether this is meaningful as a screening tool, should patients who've gotten more than 50 gray near the optic nerve to chiasms, chiasm be screened uh, is uh, an interesting question, uh, but not one that we'd obviously know what to do differently about. Uh, here's a patient of uh, Shira Simon and Dr. Gill in our retina division who had a peripapillary melanoma that was treated with proton beam radiation, successfully treated, but unfortunately presented with acute vision loss. Uh, and here you can see the sort of classic segmental enhancement of the optic nerve uh, that was typical of radiation optic neuropathy. Um, basically, we believe that this is an endotheliopathy that causes an ischemic event. Again, in the months and years after uh, radiation, uh, and unfortunately, uh, there is no uh, known treatment to be effective. For my entire career, we've bounced back and forth as to whether to use hyperbaric oxygen. There are some that say it works. There are not a lot of personal experiences on my case, in my experience where it helps, uh, but we'll often try it. Um, a, another cocktail that's often used is steroids, uh, Trenpol and aspirin uh, as a method of treating it. Uh, and then remember, there's also a radiation damage to the retina called radiation retinopathy, which looks, behaves, and is treated a lot like diabetic retinopathy with some hemorrhages and cotton wool spots. And we can use uh, laser pho photocoagulation to reduce the ischemia and the metabolic demand uh, uh, in the retina in these cases and sometimes successfully treat this. So thanks for your attention. Uh, I'll, I'll leave with some uh, caveats. Um, the, the first would be, please assign significance to anything but the vagus symptoms in your cancer patients that are complaining about the eyes or their vision. Uh, do not default and assume that the patient's, quote, eye doctor has it covered. Uh, trust experts that you know you can depend on. Uh, the direct and indirect uh, effects of cancer on the visual apparatus are numerous, as well as treatment. Uh, when in doubt, a good place to start is a consult and an MRI of the brain in orbits with GAD. That's going to get most of the things. Uh, we're entering a new era of ophthalmic side effects uh, for our biologic therapy. Uh, lymphoma does uh, incredibly interesting things to the optic nerve, the meninges, the brain, the retina, uh, always something to think about. Uh, in the end, it's uh, better to have a smart patient than a smart doctor, so listen uh, and uh, follow the patient's clues as they uh, try to lead the way. Uh, thanks for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Volpe. That was a very informative uh, and very comprehensive presentation. I think um, as we discussed that the clinical uh, relevance, I think is really um, felt across our division. We have time for a couple of questions. Um, the first one relates to um, melanoma associated retinopathy. Uh, so, you know, one of our colleagues who, who specializes in, in treatment of melanoma um, has never necessarily had a patient diagnosed with it, but wonders if we need to understand how to better recognize signs or symptoms. So hoping that you can expound uh, on that, please. Sure. So that, that is not going to be a diagnosis that uh, you would feel like you have an obligation to screen for because the patient is almost certainly going to be symptomatic, uh, presumably with a collection of symptoms that are night vision isn't right, photopsias. I, mean, I think if this were a, if I had a melanoma patient who was saying they can't see uh, and offering a complaint that wasn't obviously optical, then yes, I think you should, someone should think about it, but it's not something where we would screen for with ERGs or uh, look for it with uh, periodic ophthalmoscopy. It would be a situation in which a patient with presumably known metastatic disease is saying, I, I'm not seeing right and my eye doctor can't figure it out. And uh, can you get me to someone who understands this better and, and can work it up? So not something we generally screen for, but something that should be recognizable once you get past the uh, I can't see well, and uh, can you help me figure it out? Okay, great. Uh, another question, um, you, one of your slides uh, had alluded to the usage of high-dose methotrexate, with, which many of us are, are familiar with, especially in the context of um, primary sinus lymphoma or, or ocular lymphoma. Can you speak a little bit more about differential sensitivity to chemotherapy in the, in the eye versus systemic therapy? Are there other systemic therapeutics that we might use that you feel do have 
pretty good penetration into the uh, into the globe, um, or, or is it generally speaking the same kind of approach that we take to the CNS that we find uh, have, have it, it applies to the eye? Yeah, I, I think I think it's more the latter, and and recognizing that it is uh, completely effortless and a non-event for us to treat these disorders with intravitreal therapy. So it's not like intrathecal therapy. It's we probably do fifty to seventy-five intravitreal injections a day into people's eye in our clinic for macular degeneration. So it's something we're very comfortable with. There, there aren't a lot of retina specialists and uveitis specialists around Chicagoland that are commonly using intravitreal methotrexate uh, or, or rituximab, but it, it exists. And I think whenever the opportunity is there to, to treat it uh, locally, we try to do it, but not, not ever expecting uh, systemic chemotherapy to, to do it, but it can. Uh, and certainly radiation can do it very well as uh, equally as well. Great, thank you. I myself have a couple of other questions, but I think we're we're running past our, our designated time. Dr. Volpe, thank you so much. This is very informative. I think uh, our colleagues really found this to be very insightful and, and very helpful. So I appreciate your time and your energy uh, and your and your thorough presentation. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Have a good day.